uh, divided into two parts. The first part is for Orang Asi community specifically, and the second part is for all schools. So for Orang Asi communities, the first short-term measure that should be implemented within one year is for the government to strengthen existing programs for Orang Asli communities, including the K-9 school model, cur curriculum Asli dan Penan, and kelas Dewasa Ibu Bapa Orang Asli dan Penan to address the mismatch between home values and cultures of Orang Asli students and the school curriculum. Secondly, the government needs to establish a mechanism for consultation and negotiation with local Orang Asli communities in order to mitigate the power imbalance between schools, which are usually headed and staffed by non-Orang Asli staff and teachers and the larger communities and the larger Orang Asli community with committed and culturally sensitive staff. The only medium term recommendation is for mutual trust to be continuously built between the Orang Asli communities and the non-Orang Asli communities by equipping teachers with relevant cultural and linguistic knowledge and constructively address racial imbalances, biases and prejudices, prejudice with continuous professional training. More constructive conversations are needed, and both teachers and schools need to be willing to explore issues beyond their comfort zones. For the second part of this, uh, for the second part of these recommendations, these recommendations are meant for all schools. The first and only short-term recommendation is for. The government, uh, is what the government needs to prohibit all schools from carrying out period spot checks and other harmful acts against students. The only medium term recommendation is for the government to adopt specific guidelines on responding to violence against girls and women in all schools and universities, including prevention, protection, and provision of counseling services where necessary. Further measures relating to violence against girls and women will be explained further by Shanti in her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Nadia will now continue to present her findings and recommendations on rural health. Thank you, Gazelle. I will now continue with a different topic, which is rural health and the witnesses who have been um, impacted by this issue uh, is our Agnes Padai, who gave uh, the testimony of her late mother, Kam Abu, as well as Mekbun Akbu. Both women uh, live in rural Sarawak. I will now begin with the issues of concern. Rural women in Malaysia continue to face difficulties accessing healthcare, particularly in Sarawak, where at least 45% of the, pop the population live in rural settings. The distance of major hospitals and clinics from longhouses, settlement, settlements and villages also add on to the complexities and expenses of obtaining medical treatments. There is a large discrepancy in the doctor to population ratio for Sarawak, which is 1 to 892, compared to the 1 to 150 ratio in Klang Valley. Across Sarawak itself, there is a further large discrepancy as Kuching Division has a doctor population ratio of 1 to 604, whereas the smaller divisions of Kapit and Muka have a ratio of 1 to 1,721 and 1 to 2,000, 2,038, respectively. Some villages are still dependent on mobile clinics, 
and the flying doctor's services, which may only visit a village every one to three months. However, these services cannot medically evacuate patients in the event of emergency. In fact, patients must still travel by road, which could take five to six hours along dangerous timber roads. In these areas, doctors also provide services through a mobile boat clinic at a clinic boat bergerak for certain areas, but the availability of this clinic is also highly dependent on weather conditions. Only 143 clinics are accessible by car road, with 21 clinics accessible by logging roads, 19 clinics accessible by river, and the rest dependent on a varying combination of river, air, plantation, and logging roads. Only 170, uh, only 170 out of 215 or 79% clinics have a 24-hour electricity supply and only 128 out of 215 or 60% of clinics have treated water supply. On top of that, Specialized healthcare for cancer is currently insufficient and inaccessible to most of the rural population. There is only one main cancer facility for radiotherapy at the Sarawak General Hospital in the state capital of Kuching, staffed by five oncologists. This is far below the recommended number of 24 oncologists for the state as the recommended ratio of oncologists to the Malaysian population is 10 to 1 million persons. Patients regularly have to travel by road, air, and riverboat hundreds of miles from one end of Sarawak to the other in order to access cancer treatment at SGH or Sarawak General Hospital in Kuching, racking up to thousands in travel expenses alone. A recent report also revealed that only 73% 73 of people living in East Malaysia had timely access to emergency and essential surgery services. Kam Agong was unfortunately one of those who did not have timely access to emergency and essential surgical services that could have otherwise saved her life. Pregnant women and mothers in rural Sarawak are often un unable to access routine antenatal and postnatal services in their local village health clinic. And the journey to bigger towns and cities for routine checkups often costs many hundreds of ringgits in expense. Additionally, these women may also be caring for several other young children and not be able to take time to travel many hours for these checkups. Women living in rural Sarawak also, pay, also face severe socioeconomic deprivation stuck in a cycle of multi-dimensional poverty. As a result, they are often unable to afford a balanced diet and may suffer from dietary deficiencies that may result in anemia and other antenatal or postnatal complications. Additional barriers to maternal health care access include a lack of indigenous women participation in the professional health care workforce. A significant proportion of the healthcare workforce, workforce in Sarawak are doctors and nurses from West Malaysia who may not speak the local language or be familiar with local customs. Local Lun Bawang women may find it especially difficult or embarrassing to communicate with these healthcare workers who may not be able to speak their native language. Nearly, nearly 20 years after Kam Agung's unfortunate death, 
there continues to be no trained obstetric and gynecology specialist at Lawas Hospital and high risk pregnancies and patients requiring cesarean section are referred to Miri General Hospital or Likas Women and Children's Hospital in Sabah, which is a different state. During the COVID-19 pandemic and restricted movement orders, maternal health care access in Laos has deteriorated, has worsened further, as transfers to Sabah across the state border have been very challenging, as well as transfers to Miri across the Brunei Miri border. On the other hand, Mepo's challenges in terms of accessing timely healthcare, stand back to a larger systemic failure by the state to recognize the citizenship rights of indigenous children born in Sarawak. As she does not have a Malaysian identity card, she is unable to access diagnostic work up and care for a suspected breast cancer disease. She is also unable to access any social welfare support or healthcare support through programs such as My Salam and Bukka B40. Her citizenship issues have resulted in her being unable to access these di diagnostics and healthcare services in a timely manner, which may now have devastating consequences if her breast lung is cancerous. It is also difficult for her to access non-governmental or non-citizen support networks that assist non-citizens with accessing healthcare services, likely in part due to a lack of awareness, digital connectivity, and her remote location. We will now move on to the second segment, which is rights denied and standards not adhered. The Malaysian government has failed to upload, uphold the right to health as defined in the 1946 WHO Constitution and Article 12 of CEDAW. Access to maternal health in Sarawak is far more challenging than in West Malaysia due to a lack of adequate maternal health care close to home and a lack of trained obstetrics and gynecology specialists. Nearly 46% and nearly half or 46% of rural clinics in Sarawak are not staffed by doctors and have very limited have very limited and have very limited diagnostic and therapeutics. Around 40% of clinics do not have a treated water supply. Local clinic services, in fact, remain severely inadequate with over 70% of rural clinics not having laboratory services and 88% 80, do not have x-ray services. In fact, both national and international standards are not being adhered to in the state of Sarawak in terms of access to emergency and essential surgical services. It is also a gross, a, gross, a gross failure on the part of the state that the people of Lawas have been waiting more than 24 years for a new hospital facility after being promised one in 1996 under the 7th Malaysia Plan. This project has been identified as one of the worst sick hospital projects at the project hospital sakit in the history of Malaysia with three collapsed hospital tenders worth 100 million ringgits each. More recently, a total of 175 million ringgit has been allocated a third time to build a new 74-bed hospital, which is slated for completion by August 2023. Access to healthcare, education, and social services in Malaysia are heavily dependent on proof of citizenship. As citizenship issues often become intergenerational, 
those affected become trapped in a cycle of poverty and poor health. The exact number of stateless indigenous people in Sarawak is unknown, but this issue continues to affect generations of women and children because of excessive bureaucracy and an inability to afford the high cost of repeated travel to Sarawak's towns and cities. In fact, indigenous women and children from East Malaysia are more likely to face citizenship issues compared to people living in West Malaysia. This in itself is a reflection of the lack of adequate infrastructure, as in roads and transportation to town, and centralized registration services that require time and money to access. Citizenship applications in these, from these communities often remain unresolved for years and sometimes even decades. We will now go on to the final part, which is short-term short -term and medium-term recommendations for this particular issue. The first short-term recommendation is for the government to conduct an urgent service evaluation and stakeholder analysis of the current state of maternal health care provision in rural settings in Sarawak and Sabah to identify local needs, gaps, and enable effective implementation of service improvement and development. Secondly, the government must repeal immediately the D directive for public hospitals and clinics to refer undocumented persons to the immigration department. Thirdly, the government must conduct an open and transparent parliamentary inquiry into the delayed construction of hospital hours from 1996 and expenses incurred through previous failed tenders. Next, the government must ensure all pregnant women and mothers in Sarawak and Sabah have access to adequate, safe and accessible antenatal and postnatal care with appropriate diagnostics and therapeutics at government healthcare clinics locally, regardless of citizenship status. The government also needs to ensure healthcare access for all on a non-discriminatory discriminatory basis, including non-citizens and refugees, and provide clear information on non-governmental, non-government organization services referral pathways and clinics that provide support and treatment for non-citizens and refugees. Finally, the government must ensure that all women have adequate access to family planning services to allow women and families to time and space desired pregnancies for the health and safety of the mother and the overall well-being of the family. We now move on to the medium-term recommendations. The first medium-term recommendation is for the government to ensure robust data collection and analysis of healthcare outcomes for women in Sabah and Sarawak, stratified according to ethnicity, district, and socioeconomic status in order to improve overall public health service planning and equitable access to treatment. The government must also implement frequent and accessible education and awareness programs on various aspects of rural women's health, including family planning, sexual and re reproductive health, and hygiene. Finally, it is pertinent that the government build local health capacity by training more healthcare professionals, including specialty doctors, nurses and midwives from indigenous communities in Sarawak and Sabah to fulfill the needs of the rural communities in these states. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadia, for your presentations. The next presentation will be on the theme Violence Against Women by Shanti Dairiam. I now invite Shanti to present her findings. Oh, thank you, Gazala. 
I now speak on violence against women in Malaysia. Violence against women or gender-based violence is a very grievous form of discrimination against women. The Women's Tribunal heard accounts of various situations that serve to instigate and perpetrate a spectrum of gender-based violence. Sexual harassment, first of all, and sexism in schools is highlighted. Then Sophia's stalking experience by an ex-intimate partner. Shakila's online harassment by members of the public. Uh, she was an um, environmental activist. The backlash against a very young political activist, Alia. She faced this harassment when she openly challenged the legitimacy of the ninth Prime Minister Mohideen and his backdoor government. Evidence of harassment, therefore, takes place, especially in schools with impunity, as gathered by Putri, an activist. And there is also finally the experience of Harissa Begum, a Rohingya refugee, with little options in life due to her poverty and vulnerability as a refugee. She becomes a victim of child marriage, faces a lifetime of domestic violence, unwanted pregnancies, and deprivation of various sorts. So victims that we speak about have experienced violence in many forms. I first talk about the incidents of stalking experienced by Sophia. The, the perpetrator of this stalking obsessively stalks Sophia through various methods, such as through emails, sending her unsolicited pictures, spreading rumors, demanding sex, making contact sometimes throughout the night. He instills fear in her and intimidates her by reminding her that he is tracking her online and offline. Her space is completely a private space is completely invaded. As a result of this talking, Sophia is perpetually in fear for her safety and the safety of her son. Next, we look at online harassment that takes place. One form of public harassment is that which takes place online, especially through social media. Sometimes such harassment turns into threats of violence. Shakila, who is an environmentalist activist, working against deforestation and an abuse of power is harassed online, blamed for being outspoken with messages such as behave like a woman. The harassment and threats are sexualized, dismissive of her as a woman, and they violate her sense of dignity. The harassment also, um, as I said, turned into serious threats of violence. Vicious attacks were directed against Alia Afendi, the political activist, through every possible social media. After she challenged the legitimacy of the ninth prime minister and his backdoor government, these attacks by the public were aimed mostly to defame, discredit, and to shame her. The attacks against Shakila and Alia were aimed to put young women in their place so they don't venture into public spaces, express political opinions, or try to create or bring about change. I first want to talk a little bit more about sexual harassment and sexism in schools. Sexual harassment and rape culture, which seems to be widely prevalent in Malaysian society, is a silent issue. A very disturbing example of sexism in schools is given by Putri, uh, this is the, she speaks about the backlash against Ayn Husnita viral TikTok post where she shared her experience in encountering rape jokes by a teacher in school. Misogynistic remarks came from against Ayn came from both men and women. Putri felt that sex, such sexism in schools needed to be exposed. So she set up an online platform inviting women to narrate their experience of sexism and violence in schools. As of now, Putri received 70, 788 submissions uh, and reports of such.
such violence and harassment in schools. And 500 and, and she published 520 stories when she set up this online platform. The problem is also is compounded by the fact that when sexual harassment happens in schools, the matter is suppressed by the authorities who wish to protect the reputation of the school. There was an example of a young person groomed for sexual activity by an Ustaz, but, but instead the young person was vilified. A student who attempted rape was allowed to walk freely even after having been brought to the police station and a report made against him. There are also a lot of survivors who never talk about these matters, not even to their parents. Hence, perpetrators usually get away very easily. I wish to again uh, mention period cost checking, which was also raised by uh, Nadia. Putri reveals that period cost checking is not uncommon. When this happens again, schools are violating the privacy, the dignity, and the bodily autonomy of young girls. Another issue of concern is victim blaming and backlash against victims in schools. Uh, this is an analysis given by Putri as well. Survivors who try to seek help are dismissed by the authorities, parents, teachers, or counselors. On the other hand, the victims are blamed by teachers other students or the entire school. This silences the victims. A further issue is domestic violence, child marriage, uh, unwanted sex, unplanned multiple pregnancy and abuse. This is to do with uh, refugee Zora, from, a Rohingya refugee from Myanmar. She suffers additional trauma faces attempts at sexual assault during her journey to Malaysia. She is trafficked and money is extorted from her by the traffickers even before reaching Malaysia. But in Malaysia, she has no livelihood options or means of survival. She remarries as marriage is the only option, is abused by the husband, is insecure and goes through frequent pregnancies in Malaysia. Now, I come to the section of looking at what are the rights violated, what is the failure of the state, and what are the standards not uh, adhered to. All victims, although their circumstances were different, have been denied certain fundamental rights. The victims are denied, first of all, the right to equality, non-discrimination, and equal protection of the law, as per the Federal Constitution Article 8, and the right to a remedy. The victim of stalking, victims of stalking are not protected under the Malaysian law. Uh, stalking is widespread in Malaysia. 39% of women have experienced stalking, according to a study conducted by WAO in 2020. But it is not yet a crime in Malaysia. Number two, all the victims testify that they have not received protection from the police. Their police reports were not taken seriously. The police officers also started blaming the victims for being too outspoken on social media, especially the two activists, Alia and Shakila. The police act as judge and jury in matters like this, in situations like this. This denies the women the right to freedom of expression, participate in the public life, and it gives impunity to perpetrators. Victims are denied the, certain, the right to certain fundamental freedoms and the right guaranteed under the Federal Constitution Part 2, such as freedom of expression, peace of mind, safety and security, the right to be treated with dignity, and the right to mental and emotional health. Standards under CEDAW are also not adhered to. Article 1 and 2 of CEDAW provide for equality and non-discrimination, and CEDAW's general recommendation 35 in particular requires the duty of the state to investigate and provide remedies for violence against women. There is no refugee policy in Malaysia. That's the other problem. The situation of Haresa Begum epitomizes the dire situation of refugee women. Haresa Begum has no means of survival here. She has no right or access to reproductive services for spacing and timing of her pregnancies 
no access to reproductive health service for even childbirth. Uh, she said, I don't know what the future holds for me. I feel stuck. I have no education, no skills. I can't do anything here in Malaysia because Malaysia has no policy for refugees. The life with my husband isn't my choice. I am trapped. Here is a case of a combination of historical discrimination, which is started from her childhood and deprivation, as well as no policy for her in Malaysia that provides her with social and economic support in the country that she has come to as a refugee. Pertaining to Haraisa Begum, CIRA's general recommendation 32 requires the protection of refugee women by host country. I come now to the recommendations for these issues. The government's role is particularly crucial. Only gov the government has the resources needed to effectively and continually address violence against women across the country. And only government has the legitimacy to enforce the law. There are three major areas for reform. Number one, there has to be law and policy reform and adequate law enforcement. Stalking is not yet a crime in Malaysia. To protect victims against stalking, it must be listed as an offense in the penal code. Secondly, a sexual harassment law must be speedily adopted. Three, rape that happens, or see rape that happens in marriage must be recognized in the law. D, police inaction when complaints of violence, gender-based violence are made must be curbed and action against the police taken. The police are the frontliners to address the issue of violence that women experience. And when they are dismissive of these reports, take it lightly and, and even blame the victim, there is absolutely no access to justice for women. Period spot checks in schools must be prohibited. The Ministry of Women, Family and Community Development needs to monitor schools that, do, that ignore and are dismissive of reports of gender-based violence and harassment from students and take action against school authorities or education department that condone harassment and gender-based violence in schools. G, a refugee policy based on international standards need to be adopted in Malaysia on humanitarian grounds. And finally, uh, in terms of um, uh, law and policy and enforcement, the obligations undertaken under CEDAW must be comprehensively adopted and implemented through a multi-sectoral mechanism. All agencies of government, all ministry must come together where this is concerned. Now, the second set of recommendations, of, apart from the law, policy, and enforcement issues, are public awareness and education that's needed. The government, partnering with relevant stakeholders, should take steps to improve public attitudes and behaviors pertaining to violence against women. A, according to the CEDAW Convention General Recommendation 35, the idea of male supremacy underpins the prevalence of violence against women. Hence, a consistent public awareness program that aims to dismantle the patriarchal ideology of male superiority, entrenching men in positions of power and control must be undertaken by the state and civil society, starting with schools. This is a very long-term measure, but it is also required not only under CEDAW's general recommendation 35, but also Article 5 of CEDAW. B, comprehensive sexuality education in schools must be conducted. Extreme violence against women is one of the most destructive consequences of misogyny, which is defined as the hatred of women. It starts as victim blaming and allows sexism in schools. One way we can address violence against women and stop blaming women for it is by teaching comprehensive sexuality education in schools. Such education emphasizes the importance of communication and equality in healthy relationships. This education can help create a culture 
where misogyny isn't tolerated. It can help create an environment in which people are more inclined to intervene when they hear or see things like victim blaming and misogyny. This also equips girls and young women with knowledge to make more informed decisions about marriage. See, teachers then have to be trained to conduct comprehensive sexuality education. I now come to the third important uh, recommendation, category of recommendation, and that is funding and budgets. The government must adequately fund services to respond to violence against women. The government budget has generally not prioritized violence against women, uh, providing a response to violence against women. The government must adequately fund resources to respond to various forms of violence against women. Overall, the government should adopt a gender responsive budget process as advocated by the Gender Budget Group, a coalition of 20 NGOs currently in action as well. Conclusion, finally, by and large, gender-based violence is a silent issue in Malaysia because the victim blaming women don't come out to report. We, we don't know its full extent and prevalence uh, in Malaysia. In 2018, the CEDAW committee had recommended that Malaysia establish a system to collect data on prevalence, extent, and various forms of gender-based violence this disaggregated by age, ethnicity, and geographical location. The government must undertake this data collection. Only then can they develop a comprehensive and strategic plan for the elimination and, of, and addressing gender-based violence in Malaysia uh, so that such violence does not remain silent anymore in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, Shanti, for your presentation on violence against women. We'll now move on to the next presentation. Zaina Anwar will now present her findings on the rights of trans women. Over to you, Zaina. Thank you very much, Grizel. Okay, what are the issues um, affecting trans women? The passage of Sharia criminal offences legislation across all states in Malaysia from 1985 to 2002, which turned all manner of perceived sins into crimes against the state, has led to growing tragedies and violations of the rights of trans women by the state Islamic departments. A country in a region that historically has a relatively high level of tolerance for gender and sexual diversity including community acceptance and even fondness of matnya as trans women are known, and the important role as ma'andam at wedding ceremonies, is transformed today into increasing stigmatization, bigotry, and intolerance. The politicization of ethnicity and religion in Malaysia and the growing conservatism and intolerance have further fueled this hatred for LGBTI plus and gender diverse persons, as can be seen with the testimonies of our two witnesses, Paddy, a 28 year old transgender woman who has been arrested and penalized on multiple occasions for wearing women's clothes and Tharani Kuti, a hospital cleaner targeted for her active union involvement by discriminating against a transgender identity. Like Paddy, Trans women feel unsafe to even exist. Anxiety envelops them every time they go out for fear of raids and arbitrary arrests that could take place while they're buying food at the clubs, charity events, beauty pageants, or traveling, or even as has happened, just sitting at home. It is not just the fear of the authorities that is real. There is also fear of non-state actors. The rise of hate crimes over the past few years saw trans women beaten and assaulted by groups of men in the public space. The trans women communities live in fear of such assaults and brutality every time they go out. 
And when detained by the police or the state Islamic department, they face further assault, sexual assault, verbal abuse, violence, and sometimes even extortion by these state actors who have detained them. Further humiliation awaits them in court where they appear handcuffed and misgendered because their names in the identity card, which do not reflect their gender identity, are loudly, deliberately, loudly read out to the disapproval stares of others. Access to legal support is also limited. Even if they can afford it, there are few Sharia lawyers willing to take up their cases and approaches to state legal aid for help is usually met with the advice to just plead guilty, as Paddy informed us. Their discrimination and persecution, persecution are considered too trivial. At work, trans women are bullied and humiliated, and many face sexual harassment, name calling, taunting, rumor mongering, and being asked intrusive personal questions by colleagues. Tarani, who used to be able to wear a women's uniform as a hospital cleaner, was targeted for her gender identity once she became active in the union. She was forced to wear a men's uniform, to cut her hair, remove her earrings and necklace, and told to look like a man. What are the rights denied? What are the state failure that we can go into? The most egregious transgression in Malaysia is the fact that the bigotry, stigmatization, and intolerance of transgender women is fueled by state action. In criminalizing seemingly the very existence, numerous rights are violated, including their right to live a life free of violence, freedom from fear, freedom of movement, right to equality and non-discrimination, to bodily autonomy, to health, to work, to livelihood, and not least the foundational right to life and personal liberty as guaranteed by the federal constitution. The fact that state actors are the perpetrators of such violations shows that not only has the state failed in its obligation to protect transgender women from violence, but the state is in fact actively responsible for this. Similarly, the manner in which private actors are free to abuse and assault transgender women with impunity points to the state's complicity in such violence. In 2014, the Court of Appeal found Section 66 of the Sharia Criminal Offences Enactment of Negeri Sembilan, which makes it an offence for any male person who in any public space in any public place, wears a woman's attire and poses as a woman, that's what the law says, inconsistent, the court found that this, is, this law is inconsistent with several constitutional provisions. It violated the right of the appellants to live with dignity, equal protection of the law, freedom of movement, and freedom of expression. Specifically, it caused them to live in uncertainty misery and indignity, the court finds. And instead of enjoying such rights as livelihood and the quality of life as per Article 5 of the federal constitution, they would be deprived since they could never so-called cross-dress and go out to work without the risk of being arrested and punished under Section 66. Regrettably, most regrettably, this important landmark ruling of the Court of Appeal was later overturned by the federal court. The fact that the Malaysian government has allowed these laws to remain and also enable them to be strengthened over time is symptomatic of a failure to recognize the rights of transgender persons to live a life free from discrimination. What are our recommendations? First, the government's failure to address discrimination on the basis of gender identity has had a profound impact on the transgender community in Malaysia. They live in constant fear of being arrested and or violated by state and non-state actors alike. The fear of being jailed is palpable 
And this is where the risk of being assaulted, degraded, and being subjected to inhumane treatment is highest. Being denied opportunities and subjected to multiple forms of discrimination has exacerbated their vulnerability to endemic poverty, while stigmatization and criminalization have in intensified their poor mental health. Without adequate family support, often this is withdrawn due to shame and societal pressure, their feelings of isolation are magnified, thus further jeopardizing their well-being. There is a heavy price to pay for being brave and seeking justice, seeking access to justice. Both Paddy, who wants to live a life free from discrimination, and Tarani, who strives to improve workers' rights, have suffered under intense pressure that resulted in depression, severe stress, and being, even being suicidal. The Women's Tribunal recommends that the government takes immediate action to, number one, protect trans women from violence. This includes immediately prohibit the arbitrary arrest and detention of transgender persons. Exercise due diligence to investigate and prosecute those guilty of violence and hate crimes against transgender persons, including meeting out penalties commensurate with the gravity of the offense. To introduce a compulsory training program for all law enforcement officials to prevent stigmatization and discrimination against transgender persons and ensure that officials not only respond accordingly to reports of gender-based violence and transphobic crimes, but also refrain from perpetrating such violence themselves. Two, prevent torture and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment. Adopt a zero tolerance policy and immediately prohibit acts of torture, including mental and emotional torture and other forms of ill treatment towards transgender persons in detention, places of employment, and in public and private spaces. Investigate and bring to justice perpetrators of such violations and introduce a compulsory training program for all law enforcement officials to sensitize them on treating transgender women and other LGBTI plus persons with dignity and compassion. Number three, respect freedom of expression. Institute a legal recognition, recognition policy that allows transgender persons to change the gender markers on identity cards to match their gender identity. This existed decades ago in Malaysia, but of course was changed over the years you know, because of the growing conservatism and politicization of religion. Number four, prohibit and address discrimination. Establish effective redress and support mechanisms for transgender victims of discrimination, including legal support, psychological services, and financial aid by ensuring that their voices are considered in policy and program formulation. Enact measures to ensure protection from workplace discrimination, including facilitating equal access to job opportunities prohibiting the misgendering of transgender persons and prohibiting unjustified dismissals based on gender identity. Where measures already exist, ensure that these are enforced to provide transgender victims of discrimination with effective recourse to justice. Implement the recommendations made by Suhakam in its report, Study on Discrimination Against Transgender Persons based in Kuala, Lump Kuala Lumpur and Solano, especially the call to integrate human rights issues into the education curriculum starting at the primary level. Conduct awareness raising programs to eliminate discrimination and foster a culture of equality and diversity that encompass respect for transgender persons. This already existed in our culture, but again, chisel away and lost yeah, with the rising conservatism. The Ministry of Communications and media companies to sensitize their employees on transgender issues and reporting standards, as well as gender and human rights, 
to in order to affirm trans people's dignity, ensure higher media standards, and avoid contributing to adverse impacts of discriminatory and sensational reporting, including the loss of employment of transgender persons. Number five, finally, repeal discriminatory laws and practices. Repeal all laws that criminalize transgender and LGBTQ persons on the basis of actual and or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, as well as policies that discriminate against them. Thank you. Thank you, Daina, for your presentation on the rights of trans women. We are now at the final presentation on the theme, Young Women in Politics and Public Life. For this presentation, I invite Nadia Maliana. Thank you, Grizel. I will now present the final issue addressed by this tribunal, which is Young Women in Political and Public Life. The witnesses, who have given testimonies for this specific issue are Alia Appendi and Shakila Zen. I will now begin with the issues of consent. The visibility of Malaysian women in public and political spaces have gradually increased over the years. On the measure of political empowerment, Malaysia was ranked at 128 out of 156 countries in the latest Global Gender Gap Report. A decade ago, Malaysia was ranked at 110 for the same measure out of the overall 132 countries. So while the number of countries have changed slightly, the actual position for Malaysia for that particular measure has not changed much. When it comes to politics, we acknowledge that running for elections remain one of the crucial avenues for Malaysian women to participate. But the same structural barriers remain despite various commitments to increase the number of women in active politics and public life. The idea of 30% female representation in politics is not new. However, this idea has been popularized in the run-up to the previous general elections, also known as GE40. But currently, only 33 out of 222 of 14.86% parliamentary seats are being held by women. Only 8 out of 54 of 14.81% senatorial positions in the upper house or Dewan Negara are filled by women. Most recently, the Malacca state election in November, in early November 2021, saw only 14% female candidates or 16 out of 112 total being fielded. Prior to the dissolution of the Malacca State Assembly, there were only two female assembly persons. However, women activists, human rights defenders, as well as political figures in Malaysia continue to face severe violence and harassment, which actively threaten their safety and well being beyond their fields of work. These forms of violence and harassment include a physical violence and harassment in the form of threats of murder, assault and aggression, b sexual violence and harassment such as rape or unwanted sex, sexual harassment and unwanted sexual contact, c psychological violence and harassment including defamation, slander, character attack, harassment, via traditional and online media. It also includes D, economic violence and harassment, which involves coercive or forced forceful behavior to control women's access to economic resources, 
as well as E, semiotic violence and harassment, which is the use of language, images, and other symbols as a means to marginalize and exclude women as political actors. Women political candidates must overcome layers of discrimination to run for political office. In fact, being elected to office does not instantly erase these layers of discrimination. Occasionally, their fellow elected official even play a role in perpetuating and or sanctioning such discrimination in official spaces. For instance, Selangor Adun Jamalia Jamaluddin and Lim Yiwei received racist, sexist threats and violent threats of rape and murder via Facebook in May 2020. This was a month after MCA youth chief Nicole Wong reported receiving months of sexual harassment against her and her doctor. In fact, we can safely say that female parliamentarians from both sides of the political divide, including big names such as Teresa Kopp and Azalina Oakman, have spent many years of their career dealing with sexist remarks coming from their male counterparts in the Dewan Rakyat. Long-time female civil society activists such as Maria Chin Abdullah and Ambiga have received countless death threats as well as constant vilification in the media during their tenure as worship birthday chair. Other instances include Maisara Amira, who was detained during the May 1 anti-GST rally and claimed she was threatened by rape and public humiliation by a police officer to ensure her cooperation. Additionally, Tunku Emma Zuriana, the Malaysian ambassador for the European Rohingya Council, received numerous online threats when she called for a reversal of the government's pushback policy on Rohingya refugees in, in April 2020, with one user even threatening rape. Most recently, the series of Lawan protests, which were spread between April to August 2021, saw several female activists and protesters being targeted online and offline. For instance, Youth activist Sarah Edina was arrested during questioning at IPD Dangwangi and was subsequently transferred to the Jinjiang lockup two days before the Lawan 1.0 protest on July 29. She was eventually released at 1 a.m. the next day after mounting public pressure against her detainment. Numerous female Lawan 1.0 protesters have also reported being photographed, identified, and doxxed online after attending the protest. The Dataran Medeka vigil incident on August 19 also saw several young women activists being visibly intimidated and roughed up by police on camera. One activist eventually lodged a separate report over the physical injuries sustained allegedly at the hands of five, five police personnel who lifted and dragged her into custody. Witnesses Alia and Shakila are both human rights activists who have faced severe online and offline backlash after videos of them speaking up had gone viral on social media. Alia's virality was precipitated by a video of her at a 29 February 2020 rally against the Satu President and then Prime Minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin asking Siapa Muhyiddin. However, it should be noted that this video was filmed and uploaded to social media by an unknown individual without her consent. On the other hand, Shakila's environmental activism in her personal capacity as well as on behalf of Kwasa has drawn numerous insensitive comments and remarks over the years after her first appearance on ML Studios videos. However, 
She pinpointed the virality of her TikTok video on the Lawan Rally and her subsequent appearance on a clubhouse session titled Why Do Environmental Activists Lawan? as the point of escalation in threats. Both women faced online and offline threats to their safety and well-being due to, due to the virality that their videos have received. In fact, Alia was doxxed online and her exposed personal information was subsequently used to excavate attacks against her in Facebook and Twitter. The image of her at Dataraj Medeka continued to be made into derogatory comics and online memes months after the initial rounds of attacks died down. She was also receiving numerous emails and messages in her Facebook Messenger from strangers. Meanwhile, Shakila received a replica of a bloody hand via mail in August 2021. The package also included a photo of her with a written with a written note detailing further threats of an acid attack and burning down her family house should she continue her activism work. She later discovered that her image and number had also been misused to advertise sexual services via fake posters, leading her to receive further messages from random individuals politicizing these services. Prior to these aggressive offline threats, she had also received obscene and body, sh body shaming remarks, as well as threats towards her safety during her time, advocating for environmental, environmental justice via ML Studios online platforms. Both Alia and Shakila noted that most of the offline and online violence faced by them were committed by private actors who are members of the public who are hostile towards young women activists. The risk as political activists were compounded by the fact that the state is not supportive and is unable to protect them and their right to freely express themselves and safely do so. In fact, there were a few instances where the police actively act at, as gatekeepers to justice and refuse to recognize the rights of these women to pursue and acquire justice. This inaction and disregard by the police further compound the impact of public violence these women receive in the first place. There is a strong underlying message being sent here, which is how public life in this context, advocacy and activism is deemed as inappropriate and unsuitable for young women. We will now go on to the second part, which is rights denied and standards not adhered. Alia and Shakila were essentially denied their right to equality and the equal freedom to speak and express themselves as their male counterparts. As young women, they have rights to participate in political processes as actively and as safely as their male peers. Having a say in Malaysian policy and political landscape is a fundamental right for all and not a privilege. Instead, these young women's rights to personal safety and security were severely disrupted due to their public activism. The online and offline threats received have impacted their peace of mind and disturbed the equilibrium of this woman's lives emotionally and mentally. The state should recognize these added and gendered barriers which impact Malaysian women's right to political participation and should put in place reasonable legal protections to accommodate the ability of women to exercise these rights. It is important to note that to note that the CEDAW committee supports women's democratic voices and peaceful political participation. Women's voices are not marginal, but central, hence the, their bold role in activism for environmental rights, social inclusion, and public equal participation. Women's political protest is a strong and vital symbol of their solidarity an active role as agents of progress and development 
at the national, regional, and global level. Additionally, there is clear failure by the state, by the police failure to recognize the vulnerability of women activists and take special care to protect them. They also fail to acknowledge or recognize the gender element in the instances of violence faced by both Alia and Shakila, as harassment often becomes sexualized when young women are targeted. We will now move on to the final part of my presentation, which are recommendations for short term and medium term. I will now begin the short term recommendations. Firstly, there is a need to adopt legislation or revise existing laws to recognize physical, psychological, and economic violence affecting women in politics. A clear example of this is Law 243 in Bolivia, which officially criminalized political violence and harassment against women in 2012. Similar, similar laws can also be found in other Latin American countries of Ecuador, Peru, Costa Rica, and Mexico. Secondly, there is a need to train and guide authorities and election bodies to detect, report, and respond to violence against women in politics. Such initiatives have been highlighted in African and Latin American countries. An example of this is the deployment of monitors to collect information and refer cases of violence against women in elections by Tanzania Women Cross Party Platform during the 2015 Tanzanian general elections. Thirdly, there is a pertinent need to develop specific parliamentary code of conduct and procedures for identifying and reporting sexual harassment as adopted by the parliaments of South Africa, Canada, Costa Rica, and Thailand. These countries' parliaments have provisions that explicitly protect members against sexist remarks, sexual harassment, and threats of violence from other members. Next, the government should collaborate with social media companies and relevant civil society organizations to address psychological, sexual, and semiotic violence online. Experiences of women facing violence in public life also need to be collectively documented and shared across institutions countries and regions on a regular basis, as violence against women in political and public life should be recognized as a subcategory of violence against women. Lastly, the Attorney General's chambers should immediately issue specific guidance to the police on how to classify, identify, and investigate online hate crimes against women and girls under existing criminal laws. At the same time, the government should conduct a holistic assessment of the existing framework to ascertain and enact further laws necessary to protect the rights of women and girls to participate in the political and public space. Finally, we will go on to the medium term recommendations. Firstly, the police specifically need to play a stronger role to prevent violence against women in the public sphere and actively put out messages via public statements or other similar forms to the public discouraging such acts of violence. There is also a need to develop and provide training on new operating practices and evaluation methods sensitizing police and security forces to violence against women in public life and take it into account in their work, as well as recruiting more women security personnel. This would also include developing appropriate investigation measures to ensure such cases are acted upon promptly and thoroughly and that identified perpetrators, including where applicable defense and security forces, are prosecuted and adequately sanctioned. Additionally, additionally, in stating an independent police complaint and misconduct commission, mm. 
or IPC MC Act or another similar act that retains the spirit of this proposal would address the issue of police accountability and enable relevant cause of action to be taken against the police for the, their inability and or inaction to enforce laws that prevent them from carrying out their responsibility. Finally, I would like to conclude these recommendations with the need to normalize the participation of young women in the political and public sphere via education. Gender stereotypes need to be addressed in a productive manner by actively encouraging more young women to be involved in public facing activities and spaces via relevant capacity building and skill development programs to eventually change the general culture of these environments to recognize equal rights to public participation. That is all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nadia, for your presentation. We have come to an end to the judges' findings and recommendations. Thank you very much, judges, for your thorough presentations. We are very happy, we are very pleased that YB Datu Wira Mas Ermiati Haji Samsudin, the Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Department in charge of Parliament and Law, who readily agreed to give closing remarks. YB Datuwira Mas Ermiati apologizes for not being able to be here, but she has kindly recorded this video for us. Let us watch the video together. Please wait a while while the technical crew pulls out the video. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> up. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to all of you. Firstly, allow me to express my gratitude to the Women's Tribunal Steering Committee for inviting me to deliver this note. It is indeed a great pleasure to be among these aspiring women. Let me congratulate the committee that made up of 14th Women's Group for successfully organizing the first Women's Tribunal in Malaysia. I understand that this is also the first online tribunal in the world. This initiative is innovative, creative, bold, and comes at a timely point in time, as Malaysia is scheduled to submit its report to the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW 2022. And I must acknowledge and thank the 26 witnesses who were courageous enough to come forward to share their experience. I admit that the images of the pandemic had brought challenges to these vulnerable women and something must be done to alleviate the problems that tie them. Thank you to the judges Shanti Marie Dairiam, Zaina Anwar and Nadia Maliana who have brought in their expertise and commitment in their deliberation and the recommendation they have made today. Women's Human Rights Group in Malaysia have always worked constructively with the government to bring about reform and policy change. The fact that we recognize gender equality in Article 8 of the Federal Constitution is evident of the government's commitment to make the lives of girls and women better. The two recent federal budgets positively include additional funding for shelter space, short-term contract social workers, and the police unit that handles violence against women. I understand that there were several compelling testimonies by women who were stopped 
sexually harassed and even face violence because of their work identity or activism. Let me assure you that I am against violence in any form and I am taking an interest in the anti-stalking law and the sexual harassment law. I will do my best to advocate for this law within government. In addition to that, the government is committed to introduce anti-stalking laws together with the stakeholders with each draft and policy paper to be brought to the cabinet as early as December 2021 and to be tabled in Dewan Rakyat and Dewan Negara early next year. I believe this law is proportionately affected women and girls. The government is also committed to ensure that we implement the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CIDO, Convention on the Rights of the Child, CRC, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD, in synergy, in a progressive manner. In this regard, and further also as a member of the Human Rights Council, we affirm our commitment to uphold the fundamental obligation of the state when it comes to international human rights obligation, including under the Sustainable Development Goals and the Program of Action of the International Conference on Population and Development, ICPD. I look forward to receiving the findings and recommendations of the Tribunal. Way forward, the government stands ready to work with all of you, regardless of background, to realize our collective vision to leave no one behind at all levels, to push the boundaries forward for women. I also hope to see our younger generation picking up the battle so confidently to galvanize our collective efforts towards addressing equality gaps that women in Malaysia continue to experience. Keep up the good work and thank you for your attention. I wish you a successful commemorative session. With that, thank you. Thank you, YB Datu Wiramas Ermiati, for making some firm commitments, especially in the area of violence against women. We have come to uh, the conclusion of the Women's Tribunal. I now would like to invite Ivy Josiah, the convener of the Women's Tribunal, to deliver her closing address. Please welcome Ivy. Ivy, you can unmute. I was doing it over there. Okay. All right. Thank you, Grizel. Thank you, Mira, for my. I was being blur. Okay. Right. Indeed, we've come to an end. You know, I've always maintained that I have the best job in the world working with women for women. And for the past 11 months, an amazing and dynamic team from 14 women's groups came together to form the steering committee to organize Malaysia's first women's tribunal. Allow me to name these women's organizations, starting with the All Women Action Society, AWAM, Association of Women's Lawyer, AWL, Empower, and Gender Consultancy, Family Frontiers, Justice for Sisters, Chris Network, Persatuan Sahabat Wanita Selangor, Perak Women for Women's Society, Sabah Women's Action Resource uh, Group, that's called SAWO, Sisters in Islam, of course, Tanaga Nita, Women's Aid Organization, and Women's Center for Change. We formed a steering committee that committed itself to meeting every Wednesday. We met every Wednesday, sometimes as early as 8 a.m., to plan and to plot. And from this SC committee, there were several subcommittees formed. Again, uh, I want to thank all the subcommittees. Let's start with a very tiny, small fundraising committee made up of the conveners. And we managed to convince the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development to part with some support, some finance, <laughs> some funding, Arrow, and the High Commission of Canada. And also we had two anonymous donors. And this fundraising uh, committee is assisted by a finance committee. And I'd like to thank Awam for managing and holding on and managing the finances. And a special thanks to Sarina of Sisters in Islam who's helping me, helping us 
to um, keep the accounts. Uh, the finance committee is also made up from of a representative from AWL and KRY and, and Chris. Now, a very important committee, we keep hearing 26 testimonies, 26 testimonies. This committee is called the Issues Committee, and they had to really reach out to many partner organizations, uh, our contacts in Sabah, Sarawak, and all over Malaysia. We tried very hard. We didn't manage to go everywhere, but certainly we have to say thank you to the NGO partners and, of course, our 10 advocates, 10 um, you know, um, program officers, academics, uh, from, uh, who else? Uh, lawyers, all of them are 10, there were 10 advocates who gave very strong advocacy statements. Then from, uh, let's see now, from the advocate statements, okay, then I will want to go on now to, just a minute, yes. When the issues committee met and we were talking about the witnesses, we were we were made aware our primary concern should have should always be the witnesses. And when assessing the risk, we realized that we still need to, we will have to arrange for counseling and support services. And for this, I want to thank Betty Yo, who was always there constantly reminding us that we need to be very sensitive and make sure the witnesses are mentally prepared and they have the support around them. We also had a comms committee. Initially, we, uh, we got people outside of this 14 groups, like people like Suri Kempe and uh, Joanne Ding from uh, CIJ and even Lily Jamaluddin from uh, MST International to help us formulate and strategize a comms plan. But of course, our comms uh, strategy was really ably handled by Pravin Premanath, our comms um, commissar officer. We also had talented creatives behind the logo, the, uh, the website, which was designed by Sean Ho. And uh, the logo was designed by Shika. And of course, Marissa Victor was responsible for this beautiful video. Then we were very relieved. Certainly, I was very relieved when Chris Network said they'll take care of the arts festival. And they managed the arts festival with uh, uh, artistic director, a curator, Rupa Subramaniam. I want to thank Rupa and the artists. Shanti, thank you for looking up. <laughs> Zaida and Nadia, thank you so much. Thank you for saying yes immediately. Thank you for the, all the hard work. We gave you a hard time. We, 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 you know, I know you worked very long and very hard and thorough research. We saw today passion, the analysis. Every time we get together, Shanti, Zaina, and Nadia, we're learning something from you all. So thank you very much. And of course, supporting Shanti and Zaina and Nadia were our amazing and truly awesome advisors. They were there to provide not just counsel and research and guide, you know, uh, all of us. Uh, so I want to have a, I want to really make a special mention to Maha, to Bingui and Oisim. You know how much it means to me on a personal level and a professional level that you were there to help us out and working till the wee hours of the morning to deliver these findings and recommendations. I think both the judges too and the advisors were working until about 2, 3 a.m. last night or this morning rather. And may I emphasize that all these people I've mentioned are actually volunteers. Now, thank you very much, Adriana, for handling today's translation. And uh, I also must mention Sheena, our two language translators, and our wonderful Bahasa Isharat Malay Malaysia interpreters as, as a sign language. They were so animated and so, you know, you kept it very exciting. You did want to listen or rather Follow what you're saying because you're so animated. The America team, will you ever get over our dry runs? <laughs> we rehearsed and rehearsed. Thank you so much for not just being professional, but always warm and hospitable and, uh, you know, and, and, and listening and trying to help wherever you can. Uh, thanks, Jay. Isaac, special thank you to you, Isaac. Angitha, who's sitting in London and helping out. Uh, Mala, 
Wani and even Sandy were sitting in India and helping us out whenever we could. When we could. Of course, love and hearts to our presiding officer, Grisel. And then finally, not finally, there's still some more people to thank. Mm -hmm. uh, our grateful thanks to our full-time staff. Sheila, you were the first person to join us. And then Praveen came along. And then of course, Melora. You were so reliable. I mean, you were so talented and versatile. No task was too big for you. you just took it on. And really, it was very reassuring to know that you are there to help us out. And finally, our co conveners or rather my co-conspirators, and I'm gonna get them to come and join me here now. Come on, come on. I know you all didn't want to, but come on. Can you move your, you know what? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, that's a surprise for me. Okay, come on, come on, uh, come here. Come on, we deserve this. Come over here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I've missed that. It's spoiled. spoiled the surprise. Well, I know I'm always one up on you. Okay, anyway, so my co conspirators, I am so grateful for your friendship. I mean, we all three go back. We all began with Women's Aid Organization and look where we are here now. We have organized the first women's tribunal in Malaysia and that too, an online one. Mm -hmm. I want to say something about, I heard something recently about women's movements, about movement building. And I think it's really important for us to have, you know, have strong autonomous feminist movements because only a strong autonomous independent feminist movement can really bring about change and bring about reform. And it goes something like this. I just overheard it somewhere. I can't remember where. When we walk alone, we may go faster. But when we walk together, we will go further. Okay, agree? And let me conclude by quoting Anudati Roy. It's right. Another world is not only possible, she's on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you from Women's Tribe in Malaysia. <laughs> okay, what is your surprise for me? <laughs> she's faulted as usual. This is so that we can all share with you. Okay, after this. Uh, like, no. But first, this is from uh, Sheila, Ravin, Malora, oh my God, Grizel, Vachala, and myself. The team on the ground that have been assisting you. But first of all, we really want to thank you for helming this from the start. You know, it has been a really a learning process for all of us and an enriching process. And yes, you said we started off with WAO and not forgetting Shanti and Zai too started off with WAO. All roads all lead to, to WAO. <laughs> and for that, thank you, my dear. Thank you, Lila. Thank you. This thank is you. from us. Oh, and brilliant. Hello, thank you so much. Yet? Chocolates, guys. Okay. Oh my goodness, this is from Vachila and I, oh, so that you always remember goodness. your conspirators. Yeah, and my core conspirators. And you and it's match. No one even saying bad this. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. What can I say? Thank you very much. Like I said, best job in the world, working with women for women. Thank you. Irene and uh, Sarah's. Or rather, sorry, Hidup Rayat. Hidup Wanita. This is the distance. Okay, thank you. I think this is it. Brazil, over to you. Okay, thank you, Ivy. Uh, I'm just here to announce that uh, all of the judges' statements, the witnesses' testimonies, and the advocates' statements will be uploaded and available on our website at women's tribunal by early 2022. Do follow our social media account on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter for more updates. With that, we end the Women's Tribunal. Thank you all. I now bid you to Modono, Ahansan Oku, the Kopi Soromo, Tokowago, in Santadao, which in Kadazandusun means goodbye till we meet again. Bye, take care. Mm -hmm.